Welcome to Soul Food, a ministry of Calvary Chapel, Princeton, West Virginia. Everybody, wow. <laughs> I sound like Barry White. <laughs> that better if you can stand with me we are in John chapter 19 we're going back up to verse 32 The Bible says, So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And who has seen this has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may also believe. These things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission, so he came back and took away the body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb, while it was still dark, and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they, were, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciples who had first come to the tomb then also entered and saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must be raised again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. Father, we pray that you would bless your word today. Let it do only what your word can, and that is to enter a human heart and cause us to change. Wherever we are at in our relationship with you, I pray you would drive home the word today and anoint these lips of clay. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Does the resurrection matter? Is there really life beyond the grave? Leo Tolstoy was honest enough to say this. He said, my question that which at the age of 50 brought me to the verge of suicide was the simplest of questions, lying in the soul of every man, a question without an answer to which one cannot live. It was, what will come of what I'm doing today or tomorrow? What will come of my whole life? Why should I live? Why should I wish for anything or do anything? It can also be expressed th thus, is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? That's a pretty bleak outlook on life, isn't it? But it is a question that demands an answer. Now, Frank Morrison was not the kind of person you would find in church on a Sunday morning. He was a man, though, that was respected by everyone. He was a well-educated Englishman, an attorney by profession, and a supremely moral man, but he was a skeptic in matters of faith. By his own account, he was a man moved only by irresistible logic and verifiable fact. 
He preferred the theology of the German critics along with Charles Darwin and Sir Thomas Huxley. Therefore, he rejected the possibility of miracles or the supernatural. And he supposed that all Christian tradition should be stripped of its overgrowth of primitive beliefs and dogmatic superstition to find the real Jesus, whom he did consider an almost legendary figure of purity and noble manhood. Naturally, this meant he believed in the historical reality that there was a man named Jesus who died at the hands of Rome. But he denied the historic Christian belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so, determined to discover a Jesus unadorned by religion, Morrison set out to study Jesus' last days and to uncover the truth of that subsequent week. He chose to pursue the study from a purely intellectual point of view, using the documents of scripture, history, and archaeology. And he was absolutely committed to allow the facts and the facts only to shape his conclusion. So with a dogged curiosity and the relentless logic of a Sherlock Holmes, he was committed to unravel the mystery of Jesus. The results of his findings and personal transformation are published in his book, who moved the stone. In the preface, Morrison writes, this book is the inner story of a man who originally set out to write one kind of book, but found himself compelled by the sheer force of circumstances to write quite another. It is not that the facts themselves were altered, for they are recorded imperishably in the monuments and in the pages of human history. But the interpretation to be put up on the facts underwent a great change. Somehow my perspective shifted, not suddenly as in a flash of insight or inspiration, but slowly and almost imperceptibly. By the very stubbornness of the facts themselves, the book, as it was originally planned, was left high and dry. Because of this, Frank Morrison gave his life to the one who rose from the dead. Welcome back to our study in the Gospel of John. As we are nearing the end, we have come to the place in the Gospel that the whole book has been pointing to, and that is the resurrection of Christ. Does the resurrection matter? Is there really life after the grave? The empty tomb shouts a resounding victorious yes to that question. Look at verse 34 with me. Yet one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And who has seen this has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth, so that you may also believe. For these things took place so the scripture would be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they pierced. At that time in history, it was not uncommon to leave the bodies hanging on the cross to be the prey of flesh-eating birds and ravenous beasts. But it was the great feast time of the Jews, and it would have been unlawful to have the bodies to have remained there. So, what was to become of the body of Jesus? We talked last time about the Jews requesting that the legs be broken so they wouldn't defile the Sabbath day. Although... That was an act of blatant, nauseating hypocrisy. Think about it. They were zealous to preserve and observe the minutia of the law, while at the same time killing the one who both authored and fulfilled it. They were overly concerned that the land not be defiled, but they were unconcerned about their own defilement from murdering the Son of God. So Pilate commands the soldiers to break the legs of the crucified. Now this was done to the two others, but when they came to Jesus, they didn't break his legs. The executioner breaks the legs of the first of the one man, and then of the other. But why does he stop short? Nobody interferes to stop that fatal blow. 
Therefore, while the executioner proceeds to do his work, an invisible power intervened to restrain him. It's also intriguing that the Roman soldiers were not accustomed to disobeying the commands of their superiors. But there stood what was mightier, mightier than any leader, mightier than Caesar himself. And that was simply just a text of Scripture. You see, according to Exodus 12, 46 and Numbers 9, 12, no bone of the Passover lamb was to be broken. Jesus was the perfect fulfillment of the Passover lamb. And as such, he couldn't have any of his bones broken. Beyond that picture is the explicit prophecy of Psalm 3420 where we read, He keeps all of his bones. Not one of them are broken. But his dying early also led his being pierced to be sure that he was dead. Now, that unusual act of piercing Jesus' side was essential once again to fulfill a prophecy. The apostle quoted Zechariah 12.10, which says, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. I love the insight of one of the Puritans here. He writes, Inasmuch as sin was the moving cause of the crucifixion, and the Jews were the literal actors, not simply as Jews, but as wicked men. So the guilt of the crime rests upon the whole human race. Men look on whom they have pierced. And this is seen in three different parts. One, where Christ is known at all, he is a central, all-commanding figure. All men must look, whether they like it or not. Some look and then look away, indifferent to his agonies and to the salvation they procured. They think their self-righteousness is sufficient for salvation. Two, some look and scoff. The cross is still a stumbling block or foolishness to infidels or profane or hypercritical people. The offense of the cross still has not ceased. And finally, number three, some look and are softened into penitence and encouraged to believe and live. He finishes by saying, Hereafter, all shall someday look again, but the pierced one will not occupy a cross, but a throne, and will be seen either as a judge saying, Depart ye cursed, or as an everlasting Savior saying, Come ye blessed. Which will he be to you? You may learn from your present attitude. Medical experts tell us that the outpouring of blood and water indicates that Jesus literally died of a ruptured heart, or we could say a broken heart. Blood and water are also the fluids of birth. For just as the bride was birthed from the side of the first Adam, so the church was birthed through the blood and water from the side of the last Adam. Really, I think that the water and the blood represent the most essential elements of salvation. The water has a remote reference to baptism, but it chiefly symbolizes the moral purifying power of the word of Christ. And the blood points out the ransom paid for our guilt, as well as the atoning sacrifice. Look at verse 38. Now after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, requested a pot that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred liters weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Jesus not only exhibited his divine power over death by controlling the details of his dying, but even more remarkably, he also controlled the circumstances of his burial after he was dead. 
As was the case with his dying, by doing so, Jesus both revealed his deity and fulfilled biblical prophecy. In Isaiah 53, 9, the prophet wrote that the Messiah's grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. As I said earlier, the Romans normally refused to allow those executed for sedition to be buried, leaving them to the vultures and the scavengers as part of the ultimate indignity. But the Jews did not refuse burial to anyone, but buried criminals at a separate location outside of Jerusalem. But even if he escaped being buried with common criminals, how was Jesus to be buried with a rich man? He did not come from a wealthy family, nor could any of the apostles be considered rich men. I do find it fascinating that two men named Joseph sort of bookend the life of Christ. Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Joseph of Arimathea. One Joseph laid Jesus in a stone manger, and the other Joseph laid him in a stone tomb. Also, maybe the latter was to show us that as his sins were borrowed sins, his burial site was also borrowed. Now, we see that sometime later, Joseph of Arimathea began to make arrangements for Jesus' burial. Now, John introduces Joseph rather abruptly. We hear of him neither before nor after this incident. The burial of Jesus is the one thing for which he is known. We are only told that he was from Arimathea and that he was a secret disciple. And in fairness, though they kept their allegiance to Jesus secret while Jesus was alive, Joseph and Nicodemus both courageously braved the wrath of the rest of the Sanhedrin to bury his body. Now Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, which was about 65 pounds by modern standards. And that amount of spices would have been used to anoint the body of a king or a very prominent person. Myrrh was a fragrant gummy resin which in powder form was often mixed with aloes, an aromatic power made from sandalwood. Now this, of course, was to try to battle the stench of decay. And so Joseph and Nicodemus took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with those spices. Unlike the Egyptians, the Jews don't embalm their dead, but they use fragrant spices to stifle the smell of putrefaction for as long as possible. The spices were probably sprinkled along the entire length of the strips of cloth that were wrapped around the Lord's body. So Joseph takes the body, wraps it in linen, and places it in a stone tomb with the myrrh and spices, just as another Joseph 33 years earlier, had taken the same body, wrapped him in swaddling linen cloth, and placed him in a stone manger, and watched once again as he was presented with myrrh. Now, Joseph and Nicodemus were motivated by the need to finish their work before the Sabbath began. But there was a more significant reason that the Lord needed to be buried before sundown. In Matthew 12, 40, Jesus had predicted... For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now it's important to note that the Jews count any part of a day as constituting one day. So Jesus needed to be buried while it was still Friday. That way he could be in the tomb for those three days, which would be part of Friday, Saturday, and then part of Sunday morning. This shows us that in his burial, as well as his death, Jesus orchestrated all the details to accomplish God's already revealed purpose. Let's move into chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already removed from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. The order of how things happen that morning can be a little confusing when you combine all the four gospel accounts. But I hope to make it make sense for us this morning. 
Mary Magdalene, the woman who was the last at the cross because she loved the Lord deeply, had once been possessed by seven demons previously. But the Lord freed her, and from that time on, she followed him with all of her heart. Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love them that love me, and they that seek me early will find me. That's still true, by the way. I can't possibly overstress the importance of morning devotion. Mary Magdalene is going to be the first person to see the resurrected Christ simply because she was at the tomb early in the morning. Now, the Synoptic Gospels record various women who came to the tomb that morning, but John mentions only Mary and said that she came while it was still dark in contrast to the others who arrived after sunrise. So how do we reconcile these two seeming contradictions? Well, it's pretty easily, really. The women all evidently set out together, but Mary went on ahead of the others and arrived at the tomb first. Then Mary, running to find Peter and John, was not present at the tomb when the angel appeared to the other women and announced Christ's resurrection. Then she returned once again alone to the tomb, saw the angels, and met the risen Lord, which we will look at next week. But before that, she was as helpless and confused and hopeless as everyone else and was convinced that someone must have stolen the body. Now, we may criticize Mary for jumping to conclusions, but when you consider the circumstances, it's difficult to see how she would have reached any other conclusion. It was still dark. She was alone. And like the other followers of Jesus, she did not really believe he was going to return from the dead. But because we can view this story with 2020 hindsight, we mustn't be too hard on Mary. Imagine returning to the grave of a very close friend or family member just a couple days after the funeral. But as you approach the burial site to leave flowers, you see that the dirt has been moved back from the grave. The coffin is lying open beside the hole, and the body is missing. Well, naturally, you would be shocked, and you would assume the body had been exhumed for some reason. While Jesus had multiple times predicted his resurrection, his followers could only see those events through natural eyes. You see, Supernatural insight is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, please. So Peter and the other disciple left, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And he stopped to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there. However, he did not go in. So Simon Peter also came following him, and he entered the tomb and he looked at the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but folded up in a place by itself. You have to chuckle at this part. Church history says that Peter was a big, lumbering man in his mid-30s, while John is believed to still be in his late teens. I don't know how you picture Peter in your mind. <laughs> But I've never pictured him as a sleek running machine with six-pack abs. So it should be no surprise that John passed poor Peter up and made sure it was recorded for posterity to this very day. I guess there still might be a competitive element there. Aren't men terrible that way? But if I would have been Peter, once I arrived at that tomb, I would have said to John, yep. You're pretty quick, boy, but I've never seen you walk on water. <laughs> Another reason why God didn't make me an apostle. <laughs> we need to once again remember that the burial practices of the Jews were distinctive. The Egyptians embalmed their dead. In Roman and Greek cultures, the corpses were often cremated. However, in Palestine, neither was done. Rather, the dead were wrapped in linen swaddling clothes containing spices and were placed then on their backs without coffins in a tomb. 
Moreover, they were not completely wrapped. As Henry Latham maintains in his book, The Risen Master, he says, The dead were wrapped, but the face, neck, and upper part of the shoulders were initially left bare. Typically, corpses were wrapped with their arms folded across their torso. The head was wrapped separately with a cloth twirled about it like a turban. This is why in Luke 7, 15, when Jesus raised the son of the widow of Nain, as he was being carried to the tomb, the young man was able to sit up and speak. His head had not been wrapped yet. The grave clothes did not cover his face. We see similar evidence in the case of Lazarus in John eleven forty four. This is another reason why I am personally convinced the shroud of Turin is a fake. Jesus wasn't covered with one long shroud as his face was covered separately. Not only that, but I don't think God would allow that since mankind has a propensity to worship sacred relics all the way back to the bronze serpent. I remember one man saying that while he was in Israel, a man tried to sell him a piece of the skull of John the Baptist. When he told the man that another man had tried the same thing the day before, the salesman, without missing a beat, said, Oh, that was John's skull when he was just a boy. <laughs> Later you'll get that and laugh. But unlike Lazarus, who needed help getting out of his grave clothes after the resurrection, Jesus' glorified resurrection body simply passed through the linen wrappings as it would soon pass through a locked room. Now this does kind of remind me of the rapture. If the rapture was to happen right now, if you are a Christian, we would be gone. But our clothes would be left behind, along with any jewelry and teeth fillings. And if you've ever had any plastic surgery that nobody knows anything about, well, we'll just leave that right there. Verse 8. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb also entered then, and he saw and believed. But they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So the disciple went away, the disciples went away again to their own homes. In verses 5, 6, and 8, the word see or saw is used. First, John came to the tomb and saw the linen clothes lying there. The word translated saw there is blepo. And it just means to look at and to see visibly. In verse 6, Peter saw the linen clothes lie there. But the word there is theoro, meaning to study more carefully, and from which we get our English word theory. And finally, in verse 8, the word translated saw is ido, from which we get our English word idea, or I know what to do. I find it interesting that most of our time, Faith progresses according to that very pattern. First, you are exposed to some piece of teaching. You hear what the teacher is saying. Then, like a theory, you give it some more thought. And then finally, down the road, there comes a moment when you really get it and you know what to do. It's not just a concept theologically, but it becomes part of your life personally. But if you never hear the information, you'll never be able to embrace it. And that is why you'll never see the process unfold if you don't come to the place where you can investigate the claims of Christ. So be faithful in church and stay in the word of God. But I'm not getting much out of it, you might say. You wait. Eventually, it will begin to stir something in your thinking and finally, it will become part of your being. The way to solid Christian growth is to listen to sound and solid teaching, read your Bible, and stay in the Scripture. And you will, if you do that, you will see that process unfold, even as it did for Peter and John. Verse 9 tells us they did not completely understand the Scripture that Jesus would rise from the dead. Now, it does seem incredible that the followers of Jesus did not expect him to come out of that tomb alive. After all, he had told them many times that he was going to rise from the dead. Early in his ministry, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And so I return to my opening question. 
Does the resurrection matter? Is there really life after the grave? Sometimes I hear people say, I really struggle with this or that aspect of Christian teaching. I like this part of Christian belief, but I don't think I can accept that part. I would respond, if Jesus truly did rise from the dead, then you have to accept everything that he said. But if he didn't rise from the dead, why worry about anything that he said? Not only that, we are called to obey the scriptures whether we like what they say or not. There's all kinds of stuff I obey, even though it makes my flesh scream in rebellion. So the issue is not on, on which everything hangs, is not whether or not you like this teaching or that teaching. It is simply whether or not he rose from the grave. I'll close with what N.T. Wright said. He said, the message of the resurrection is that this world matters to God, that the injustices and pains of the present world must now be addressed with the news that healing, justice, and love have won. If Easter means Jesus Christ is only raised in a spiritual sense, then it's only about me and finding a new dimension of my spiritual personal life. But if Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, Christianity becomes good news for the whole world. News which warms our heart precisely because it isn't just about warming our hearts. Easter means that in a world where injustice, violence, and degradation are endemic, God is not prepared to tolerate such things, and he will work out a plan with all the energy of God to implement the victory of Christ over them all. Take away Easter and Karl Marx is probably right to, when he accused Christianity of ignoring the material problems of the world. Take it away and Freud was probably right to say Christianity is only wish fulfillment. Take it away and Nietzsche was probably right saying that Christianity is only for weak people. So one last time, I'll ask us the question, does the resurrection matter? Is there really life after the grave? Actually, it's really the only thing that matters. And so the good news is he has risen, and he has risen indeed. Father, we thank you that some people want many ways to God. The amazing thing is that there is just one way, that you provided a way. Because had you not done that, we would all be eternally lost this morning. Lord, only you know the hearts of the people in here and the hearts of the people that will listen to this on the internet. I pray, oh God, that you would reveal yourself by the Holy Spirit and show them where they are truly at with you, where they need you as a savior, a sanctifier, or an encourager. You can be all those things. We are so thankful for what you have done for us. That's these things in Christ's name. Amen.